I hear these kind of truisms stated by retailers like, you have to play the base that you're going to buy. I think that's the worst thing you can say because... Great if you live in New York City. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> or, or have 10 grand you can spend on traveling, right? But sometimes you have to trust people. Right, and sometimes you have to trust someone's reputation. Sending out those videos, and I can hear it, and I can feel it, and I trust this company's not going anywhere, and da 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 da. That's what I tried, right, Eric? I really drilled home. I said, you know, for a long time, like, give them more pictures. Yeah. Give them the videos. Give them everything they need to make a decision. It finally happened. Been wanting to have this conversation for years, and it finally happened. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contra Race Conversations, and we are chatting today with, yes, Eric Roy and Gary Upton of Upton Base. And as I was booking my recent trip to New York City, I knew that heading up on the train to spend a day at the Upton Barn in Mystic, Connecticut was a must happen. So it happened. And here it is. It was a great conversation about all kinds of things, like the way that Upton Base came into existence, really uh, interesting and unconventional, how the company grew from selling base accessories to now they're building over 120 bases a year. Whoa! Staying ahead of online trends, designing a base for Gary Carr, and so many other topics. Really fun conversation done live up on the second floor of the base barn in Mystic, Connecticut. You got to get there if you haven't, folks. Very cool. And I'd like to, first of all, give a shout out to Upton, both for having this conversation and for being a longtime sponsor of the podcast. Goes without saying, but I think these guys are awesome. And I would have wanted to chat with them even if they weren't a sponsor, but thank you also for sponsoring the podcast. And thank you also to D'Addario Strings, A440, and Steve Swan String Bass. You'll be hearing more from them later. And I just am so thrilled to bring you this conversation with Gary and Eric of Upton Bass. Finally, here in the barn, Mystic Connecticut with Gary and Eric of Upton. So welcome, guys. Hey, Jason. How are you? What's going on, Jay? <laughs> it's, it's good to be here. Can't wait to, to dive in. And one of my most requested interviews is with you guys. So we, We've been talking to you about doing this for a while. I was and going back in my email. It was giving me anxiety. I started like listening to everyone else's podcast going, oh my God, I'm not yeah, smart. We're gonna I can't like do this. Yeah, we're going to sound like bozos. <laughs> <laughs> no. Before we dive in, there are a lot of topics we can go into, but let's just take me through the history of Upton. When did this, when did you start this thing, Gary? Well, I'm going to moment, I'll talk for a moment and then we always say our company company historians, Eric. So we're going to, I started wanting a base to go to college with, uh, in 1999, definitely in the industry, people, you know, might scratch their heads at this moment and be like, wait, what? That's Gary's age, huh? But, uh, you know, in 1999, I wanted, I graduated high school, uh, wanted to go to school to play bass. I ended up going to Western Connecticut and I couldn't afford my own bass. My single goal for this quote unquote company back then was literally just to get my own base. <laughs> so you got to, re- 1999, if anyone can remember, the, the young ones won't know, but th- these are the days we were talking about the internet going away. Like it was, oh, it's it was just a, a fad. fad. Yeah, that's right? Right. right, that's right. And, and so if you remember like want advertiser and all of these paper ways that we would all find each other, right? Or antique stores, for example, early days Upton Base was Gary scouring that stuff taking a product from a local kind of, you know, you had to have like a secret handshake to know who your base luthier was, right? You know, it was like this guy's name and ask for Joe. And after you ask for Joe, you can get Tom's number. And when you finally have that, then you can go and see three bases. <laughs> God knows if they're good or not. Um, you know, and so I was taking this product from a, from a you know, a local small you know, drive your car, go find it kind of buying process to a global economy, right? Online, at least really the early days up to base was just taking a product from a, you know, buy, buying in that fashion and advertising in paper. And, you know, that's, that's how we started. Yeah. Uh, that's how I started. I mean, I, I never planned to make bases. I fiddled around. No one ever does. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Eric uh, came by way of, you know, early on, I was buying and selling generally old stuff got into some newer things. Eric worked at a musical instrument distributor. Um, We became friends uh, like brothers from the start, right? And, you know, we we used to joke, you know, he went to North Bennett for violin making and we would often joke that I used his education more than he did. I'd say, hey, Eric, you know, I worked with a couple other luthiers too in person, but Eric was kind of like my call a friend. Hey, we've got this going on at the shop. And, you know, he'd come down and do some moonlight work with me and, 
you know, we, we kind of started early days like that. Yeah, yeah, well, I, remember, I remember that first, sh you know, showroom. Yep. You know? And yeah, then, it, was, it, it was, I had a showroom in Jewett City, Connecticut. Okay. So people would, which, which a bass player didn't mind. Like, you wouldn't care. You'd come in, it was cool tin ceilings, beautiful little space. But the local residents, you know, these are people that, you know, from my hometown per se, like, why is he doing that here? <laughs> and, and that's where I'm going, well, there's this thing called the internet. And that's how people are finding me, and they don't really care where I am. They just care what's going on inside those walls. Right. So, you know, that's Eric. Eric used to, you know, I used to say, hey, you're going to work with me someday, and oh, you can't afford me, right? How did that go? Just basically like that, like, hey, you, you can't afford me. Right. You know, he was a one man shop, and, and, you know, he would take half the summers off. Um, sometimes it seemed like yep. painting houses and stuff, you yep. know? Doing was, whatever it was. A, it was a side hustle initially. Yeah. It was, a, like he said, it was a side hustle to get himself a base. Yep. So, and then you started in 99 and I met you in like September of 2000. Yep. He came in to pick up a base from the distributor I was working at and we just kind of hit it off. And, and uh, the other salesman, cause we were, the, you know, we were both young, gave me his account. And so he had ended up turning into my best account, yep. you know? But yeah, so I mean, so Gary had like literally was hand coding a website. <laughs> Uh, you know, but this is when you could do HTML, right? Right, right? Just HTML. Right. I remember the early days being able to click on a banner on an eBay ad that brought you to another website was like top grade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. click here to go to uprightbase.net. That's what that, I don't know if you remember. That was that. the original URL. Yep. Man, I would love to see what that original <laughs> website looked like. I, I there there is the internet wayback machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. It's, it's still oh, there. Yeah. It's okay, still you know there. how to find oh, it. You'll find I've it. I've gone to my first site. <laughs> I just I want to claw my eyes out. It's, it's a, a, Upton Base, the place for Upright Base. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and then when we first so we had this website and he just had some pictures of bases up and stuff and I'm like, well, that's cool, but you know people don't buy bases every day but they buy strings every day they buy they buy cases every day so i kept kind of pushing them i'm like hey why don't you just put everything we have that's base related on your site you know because that's if they're buying strings from you once a year then you know something happens and they need to buy a base they'll remember oh yeah there was this website there was this guy this is who i bought my strings from so I mean, initially, I mean, we were friends, so it wasn't like I was taking advantage of them. But originally, I was just like, "Hey, this is a you know yeah. good way to get a customer buying more." Yeah, yeah. Me. no, definitely. You know? I mean, there are products that that company had we won't name them, but that didn't exist in the marketplace. And Upton yeah. Base put them, uh, or even this early on, put these products on their website. And then Eric was able to use it almost as a tool to his other clients to say, "Hey, look what this guy's doing." And next thing you know, they've taken a non-known string or whatever it be, and boom, the whole industry's selling it. It's funny they can go away that quickly too. Yeah. Maybe I still regret a little bit selling all that stuff online you know today you got amazon doing it yeah you know where does I mean, this, the race to the bottom how does this go yeah much different environment today you know we, we do what we need to do to keep to keep ourselves relevant but um yeah especially with amazon and stuff no one in this business is making money selling well strings. how often do you go in a restaurant with a salad bar these days right right it's kind of like the salad bar it's kind of like the strings and accessories you know and, and our clients obviously it's what they need and they're buying it often. They're buying a base, not so often. But luckily, we have the relationships that so but many it's of relationships. Our, yeah, yeah, our customers yeah. are awesome. Yeah, no. they're, we always say welcome to the family when they buy a base. And yeah. there's thousands of clients now that have instruments from us. You know. Well, and I was just talking to Eric before we got going with this. The the name that I get emailed about more often than anybody is Upton Base. He was like, oh, I pay, okay, my, when you sign up for my email list, the first email that I send out says, tell me a little bit about you. I can't tell you how many times they said, oh, I have a Bostonian or nice. I have a Brescian or I've, I've been checking out Upton stuff. And th that's something, and this is not new, right? You, you guys have been, and again, going back 20 years, 1999 and the Y2K worries, yeah, you're already right, getting yeah, that all, that? right? I do remember that. Um, so you've, you've managed through all these different phases. I mean, I mean, 20 years in internet times is like, like, yeah, like 200, 2000. Yeah, two, yeah right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so, uh, take me through that. So you're, so you're selling accessories back in the early 2000s, selling strings and stuff like that. Now here we are, I'm walking into this, this great facility. I walk up the stairs, I see all the International Society of Basses Awards and the stairways we go up, the workshops filled with people making basses. You're putting out 120 basses or so a year, um, plus restorations and repairs. So how, how'd you get from selling some strings on a hand-coded website to uh, here? It's a I, big I, I have one comment. <laughs> I have one comment I'll throw in, right? It's, it's kind of like, um, how would I say? My ego doesn't want to say this, right? And Eric's won't like it either. 
but because of the timing, we couldn't do again what we've done. Yeah. And and there's there's a big there was a big study done by Harvard, I think, or MIT, or both probably. And they they had spoken about um, the biggest essential piece in building a bit. I think it's a TED talk even in, in building a business. Is it the team? Is it the product? Is it the is it the intellectual property? What's the biggest piece that determines? You know, before Netflix, there was Blockbuster, right? During Blockbuster's time, there was there was some online video company. Yeah. It, look it up. Yeah. Uh, this guy cites this stuff in the in the TED talk. And why did it not work? It wasn't that the idea wasn't exactly the same as Netflix. It was it's simply the timing. The, the timing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The connectivity of the internet. You can't download a movie at fifty six k. I mean, you can, but you can't enjoy watching it until next week. Right. You know, yeah. so I think had we like done everything we did, I wouldn't want to try and do again what we're doing today starting now. No, no, no. thanks. You know, it was different too. I mean, when we, when we, we were young, I mean, we're still young, but yep. we, we were younger and burning 60, 70 hours a week trying to figure out how to I think to Eric's make being conservative. Bases. <laughs> 60, Eric? Uh, well, yeah, right. <laughs> but, but we did. We worked. We worked. Yep. Put in know? the hours. The 10,000 hours. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, exactly, and, and right? you know, I think we, we had a period when we first started out to make bases, it wasn't make one base. It was make a thousand bases. Yeah. So if you did something, it was take the time to do it a thousand times. Don't just jig up to do it once. And that's where we're a very unique combination. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't do it without Eric. Eric couldn't do it without me. You know, he went to school to learn how to make a violin. Yeah. Well, how do you make a bass? You just do a big violin. It's a big right? violin, right? But he'd watch yeah. me look. He'd be like, well, how do they teach you in violin making school? I'm like, well, we do this, this, and this. And then Gary's mind would look at and go, okay, well, let's change that order and add in this thing. Yeah, good, and good next luck. thing you know, it you shaved off three hours. Yeah, good luck joining a thousand tops or a hundred bass tops, you know, with a, with a bench plane, right. You know, like continuity of product, which we have fabulous reputation. We've got great product across the marketplace. Do you have seconds? No. Right. Yeah, exactly. No seconds are in the dumpster. <laughs> yeah. So Jay, but Jay, Jay asked us to kind of go through the history. We were importing instruments. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, fast forward a little bit past accessories into, you know, I did the whole, I bought stuff from your in, insert Chinese distributor here. I bought onesie twosie from those guys. We got too far into that with a big name in the industry for a while and couldn't handle all the, the comebacks on that. But, you know, we went from buying instruments over, you know, onesie twosie from Eric to buying instruments overseas from a variety of manufacturers to taking those instruments and having those manufacturers customize them yeah. and then having those manufacturers not finish the manufacturing. So what's really interesting is the way, steps. Yeah, yeah. the way we got in the manufacturing process was reverse engineering per se. You've already got a guy setting bases up, installing tuners, fingerboards, setting necks, at some point carving F holes. Well, heck, it's not that much more when Eric and I have a long conversation, me saying I want to make strings. I, I, Rich Wager commented yeah, on that thing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Ask Gary when he's going to make strings. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, and Eric and I having that long talk, like Gary wants to make strings. And Eric, you know, he said, well, you know, two things. We already know how to make instruments. We've already done tons of restoration and repair at that point too, right? And we're already probably three quarters through the process. So then we stopped getting containers of instruments. Right, yeah. Which was... A lot of dough all at once. So it was, it was taxing and the quality was going down, down, down with every shipment, you know. And at that point, we were doing so much ourselves anyways. Final assembly, varnish, setup. It was kind of a no-brainer to start making them in-house. So what was that, set the, the scene timing-wise, what year approximately was that that you started, that you made the switch? 2006. Okay. We started... Like five and six, right? Okay. Yeah. Because there, there's transitional instruments, too. Yeah. Not a, not a ton of I them. I mean, to this older. day, if someone calls me up and says, hey, I got an Upton bass from 2006, was it made in the U.S. or is it one of the European ones? It's like, I need to see a picture of the scroll. Yeah. Okay. That's the only way I can okay. tell. But then there's even some bodies which we said we'd never do, but there are bodies with American scrolls in them. Yeah. That, you know, but that's a little bit of the secret sauce right there. Okay. Not to say that we're <laughs> trying to be mysterious, but, you know, it's uh, how many instruments to date in America, Togwonk, Business Park, Mystic here entirely in the U.S., do we approximately? Just completely ourselves? Yes. I think probably up over 1,600 now. Yeah. Right. Okay, right. Coming, so. up, coming up around 1,700. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's an extraordinary amount of instruments. I mean, uh, the flatbacks and the, um, we keep a different opus number, sequential opus number for laminates, hybrids, uh, flat, solid wood flatbacks, and solid wood roundbacks. So I think roundbacks were like in the 90s, flatbacks, I don't know, I'd have to take a look. 
a couple hundred. I think an interesting thing to go into is like, if you remember the Euro started, so we, we've got we've got orders of America of, of instruments that we're putting our name on. You know, they're, they're, we weren't saying we're making European instruments. We have never done that. That's not our that's not our gig, right? We do like distributed buy whatever, but we're taking orders for instruments. They're upped in base, finished, so on and so forth, and then we're receiving a deposit having to send our money overseas to then wait for that good to come in and we're spending money in in selling in that moment in u.s dollars which we're thinking give us you know 1.28 against the euro and then you're seeing at the time basically by the time you pay the distributor because you want to accrue a bunch of instruments to place an order for 60 or 100 bases um you're watching the euro go from oh look it's dipping to oh now you're trading currencies mm-hmm. too much of a headache yeah and then the stuff's showing up and like eric eric made a really good point like the do you you know do you guys have any b stocks you know like or you know blems or something like that that's what we dealt with and people are so used to seeing from i think the chinese and the european factories where rather than someone just looking at that piece of wood and saying man i gotta throw that in the fireplace yeah they, they, they go, ah, my boss says I got to get this thing done, so they so set that in. neck. Yeah. And, and we've just learned over the years, if a piece of wood, if you got to question the piece of wood, it just goes in the dumpster. It just get out so of there. So there's never a B stock base that hits the showroom floor because we made the right decisions on the front end. I would rather, have, I would rather be weeks behind production schedule than have a go back. And that's what we call it, you know, if something comes upstairs and it's not quite ready, it's got to go back downstairs. So never mind, you know, a, a scroll with, with a, a crack in the heel. Yeah. That, that just, that's unacceptable. It doesn't happen. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And Steve has been researching top graduation for many years. Here's Steve on the topic. I found some old uh, diagram bass tops in an old violin making book that had violins, violas, cellos, and only four basses from kind of the classic period, the early 1800s. And I took a pattern of uh, kind of a topographical map of thicker in the center under the bridge, and then, you know, the thinnest is right near the edges, you know, just before it flares out and gets strong again. And I put in some measurements that I thought would work, and we use that as a general pattern for top graduation, and it really works. You would be amazed how well this technique works. I've been impressed time and time again at how immediately a bass speaks after coming from Steve's shop and how resonant and beautiful and open the sound is. Learn more at steveswanstringbass.com and thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve. So remember that, how, how many necks did we carve for that one? That is it that, that, that 7 eighths Cavani? Yeah, yeah the, the one for the uh, 2015 ISB. Yeah. I think I was finally on my third yeah. neck wow. that, that I had to throw away. You get like two days into it, and, you, and there's a there's something in there that yeah. you couldn't see from the outside, and you're like, well, I'm dead in the water on that. And you want you want to like look back at your distributors, right? And, but like they don't have. But they X- don't know X-ray vision, right? What what? I just out of curiosity, as a as a as a non luthier, like what what are some things that you might discover as you're working on a neck? Is it like a knot, or is it or some, any piece of wood? You got sap pockets, knots, pinholes. Okay. Uh, you know, we've gotten really good at reading the wood. Like mm. we can look, I can look at a top and based on the colorization of it, I'll know that there was something in the tree. Let's say there was a, uh, a crack or a bullet hole or something. The, Which the, we, we, we pulled bullets out of maple. Yeah. So basically the, the tree kind of bleeds, it, you know, the sap runs up and down. So if you have some sort of a trauma in the wood, you know, 10 feet up the tree, you can still read that that was there. Yeah. So, you know, when you see certain colorizations to look for things, to look for blemishes, look for something that's going to stop you dead in your tracks you know mineral stains that's the tree's way of uh, strengthening the wood to deal with it with a trauma so if i'm carving a neck and i see heavy mineral staining my eyes are wide open i'm looking for the trauma and it could have happened it could have been a hurricane in the middle of the forest you know nothing the wood dealer uh, wood cutter did wrong nothing we did wrong nothing in storage uh, i've said it a million times you're making something by hand out of wood you can do everything right and it can still go sideways yeah and it can be it's it's, it's interesting to see like eric saying you know you get this perfect specimen right even sometimes you can't see you know so you get really committed to the work that you put in right this is your ego you're like oh man you know I got 14 hours into this or whatever I do. And then you do find that, like those T-bones, we call them, like the ones you see in the maple. Yeah, yeah. They're just like, 
it looked like the end of what looks like probably a branch, but I don't think they are. Or maybe a branch that didn't get enough light, so the tree thought it was going to do a branch and then just mm. gave up on it and put the energy somewhere else. Yeah, so, so you know, and you'll find one of those. You've cut the neck out. You've roughed it out. You're all, it's a beautiful piece of wood that was two, 300 euro. Yep. And then it shows you that right at the end. Yeah. You're like, forget it. Uh, I mean, even like, I'll show it to you later, right? behind you there next to my computer there a bridge blank from you know from a really good french bridge mm -hmm, maker mm -hmm. we got i don't know how many hours into it and jack brings it up to me and goes i'm dead i gotta start over because uh, there's a there's something in there right where we need that. it to be I'm, I'm looking at the bridge right now yeah, yeah. Oh. so look, you know fitting the feet perfectly i mean by the time he's doing the top the feet yeah. already fit how much time did he have invested in that you can yeah. do everything right you can do everything you right just, you're dealing with this this uh organic thing growing mm -hmm. out in the elements reacting to right. things that you just can't predict but and these guys and these guys kick ass i yeah. mean they're fab I lo we love their bridges we've yeah. been dealing yeah. with they're them for company. years we're not going anywhere we know that has nothing to do with them right that what you know and, and i mean i'll take a picture and send it to them and yeah. say hey I know you didn't see this, right. but this, you know, can I get a credit? You yeah. know? And, and yeah. You, could, you could argue, you know, what, what our job is to look back and say, all right, did Jack do his job? I mean, you, look, you can't now, and you can take a picture of that if you want yeah, to show people what I we're will. talking about. Yeah. Should Jack have carved through the, no. Yeah. No way would I look back on the process and say that's a hole in process. Right. No right. way. That just, yeah, right. that just, that happens and you deal with it and you move on. You don't look back. You just, you got, just keep going you forward and you go forward one. fast because and you I, just lost three hours. <laughs> yeah. And, and and I'm sure Jack. So when Tom in Nebraska to wants to know why his base didn't get, you know, delivered on, on the deadline you thought it was going to get delivered, it's like accumulation of those things that's why yeah. we say never quote deadlines yeah yeah <laughs> well and, and that's sort of communication and that's something and there's again so many directions we can go but that's something i think you all have been known for for ever since i i, I think i saw the first youtube video from from you guys you've been incredibly good at just communicating about the process about the models and i just i love you you seem to be like a few years ahead of where everybody else is thinking like and time and time again through these 20 years, you know, um, what inspired you to start doing videos to start evolving the way you have online in terms of your message? Yeah. I remember buying that first that Sony first camera, camera that. Uh -huh. that you put the f a floppy <laughs> disk in. Oh, yeah. So the college wow. kids are going, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> but you literally put the floppy disk in and, and then I would just, Eric would take, or I would take a video of my bad bass playing but it was still more than someone else could touch and feel on the internet. And I'd email them what it gave you again in, in a world you can say sitting out in Nebraska or wherever you want to be, you know, I hear these kind of truisms stated by retailers. Like you have to play the bass that you're going to buy. I think that's the worst thing you can say because great. If you live in New York city. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> or, or have 10 grand you can spend on traveling. Right. But sometimes you have to trust people. Right, and sometimes you have to trust someone's reputation and what they're capable of, and all of that, such, such and such. Right, so we're able to essentially, and I'm going into three different directions here, but sending out those videos, they're either fake, right, and they're just super impeding, uh, you know, a bass player that I want to sound like, or maybe that is Gary playing the bass, and I can hear it and I can feel it, and I trust this company's not going anywhere, and da 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 da. That's what I tried, right, Eric? I really drilled home. I said, you know, for a long time, like. Give them more pictures. Yeah. Give them the videos. Give know. them everything they need to make a decision. Yeah. Oftentimes. And hopefully at the end of the day, we're the decision they make. Yep. You know. With the older bases, like one of our, you know, this is a little secret sauce and you can share this with everyone. Like we almost want to show you what's wrong with it. If I show you the worst version of what the instrument is, you know, and, and uh, sometimes we might, we might not veneer it that way per se, like in presentation. Right. But if, if your expectation isn't the best sound of this bass and you're like, wow, that has a beautiful, clear sound and so on and so forth, you know, and you see everything that you're looking at and I've pointed out the problems, then you're just, you're never disappointed. So under promise, over deliver. We always try to do that. Try to do that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and just yeah. being I'm trying to give authentic. You, we're yeah. trying to give you more than you give us. Yeah. Every single time. Right. Yep. Every single time. Yeah. Right. You know. And, and that's what people expect for us. The, I mean, honestly, when people open that crate, man, the bar is so high. It doesn't matter if it's a two thousand dollar laminate base or it's a twenty thousand dollar one-off. The bar is so high 
maybe because of the amount of time we've been doing it, the awards on the wall, the gossip, the reputation, the marketing. But by the time they're opening their crate, they are invested so much into us. They're expecting the world and, and we have to meet that expectation every single time. Well, and I just, as I was walking in, Eric was pointing out, you know, on, on one bench, a laminate base given the exact same care as a fully carved base, as a hybrid base, right? So the quality of craftsmanship is the same across the board. Yeah, yeah. there's there's no B team. Right. Right. You know? Yeah. There's no B and it has stock. To be, there's because, no B team. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I don't want to sell you one base. Right. I want to sell you like four. You know, when you're in high school or, or or college or just starting out or you just you know, 30 years been playing double base or electric base and now you're about your first double base. You know, you're starting off with a twenty five hundred dollar laminate, and then I I want you to I want you to grow it. I want you to. To come back and say, now I'm ready for the hybrid. Or, now I'm ready for the, the solid wood base. Or I'm retired now and I want to take a bit of my pension and get the dream base, you know? Uh, we have people on their fourth, yeah. I think fourth bases now. Yeah, but at the, at the same time, we also hold people to the flame a little when you know someone might be underbuying. Like, you know, a, a guy that can but is kind of underbuying for himself. You're like, we don't, while we do want to sell you four bases, if that's the progression that needs to happen for financial reasons and or fiscal responsibility, right? Sometimes it's like, hey man, I don't want to sell you two bases here. Let's do it the right way the first time. Yeah, That, that happens too. That. Well, no, and I think that's another secret sauce you just touched upon is we take the time, you know, by the time I'm taking an order, we may have a dozen emails. We got a couple phone calls back and forth. I mean, it, it is extremely rare that the phone rings, hey, first time caller, uh, here's my credit card. Yeah, yeah. We've got a relationship. Oh, yeah. Hours and hours you know? and hours. Right. So Gary right. and I have like, we've listened to you enough that we've, within your budget, we've gotten you into the right base the first time, which is, I think is a huge reason why. Like you said, communication, Jason, right? So many good reviews. <laughs> like people call up, I can't find a bad review on you online. It's like, because well, Gary and I over the years have just done our job well of listening to you and then helping to get you into the right base for what you're telling us. And over the years, I mean, the, the, the evolution uh, from when you started making your bases in all your bases in house, you have all these different models and then people can customize accordingly, right? Can, uh, can, can you just talk through maybe how the evolution of some of these models, like when I know you have the car base, you have the Bostonian, the Brescian, how did that all start? And um, just take me through some of that progression. Originally it was one base. Right. Yeah. It was a big old Hawks or Pernormo inspired violin. That was the style. That, okay. that was the yeah. style. Okay. At first, but then think and about then it. We figured out how to change our form um, to make it instead of a rectangle, let's say a trapezoid. So it was small in there about. Yep. And then we figured out, well, if I just put these corners on it instead of that one, now I have a gamba corner instead of violin corner. So it started off, everything was a Pernormo inspired violin cornered bass. And then we just figured out how to manipulate the form and our, our building style to make essentially four different bases. But before we did that, yes, essentially four bases. Before four outlines. Rem yeah, remember before we did that, Eric, we were, were kind of like, if you called and said, I want this, we would say yes. Never expecting to see, you never anticipated from where we were sitting that we would have to worry about, I don't mean this in a bad way, but have to worry about our product in the marketplace. So like, you know, I never understood that we would be able to say today, our biggest competitor is our own used product in the marketplace. Yeah. It happens all the time. Hey, I'm thinking about getting my own, but I've also seen on XYZ, there's one for sale. Early on, because you know, you're just getting going. It's like, play, it's like playing gigs. Mm -hmm. Hey man, we need you to play this, no problem. We need you to do this, no problem, no problem. You get built up, you're like, well, I'm not really doing that stuff anymore. <laughs> I'm right. not doing the fifty dollar bars anymore. Yeah. Like, yeah. you know, I I, I got to get at least one hundred and ten bucks to put the bass in the car, or I got to get two hundred. Or hey, I'm not doing the jazz thing anymore. The symphony thing's really been starting to work for me, and I'm putting all my folk. You know, right? I mean, we would pretty much outside of painting a bass, pretty much do whatever you wanted. Right. And then we kind of said, where Eric was going with it, like, all right, we're we're honing in these models. Yeah. Well, we got. I'd say we got we got geeky. We we started. So there's a joke about American instruments, right? Um, if yep. I can take four violins and go to a, let's say a top-notch violin appraiser, and he can take the first one out and look at it and go, well, this one's clearly Italian because of all these features. Next one, oh, this is French because of all these features. Next one, no, this is English because of these features. Fourth violin, they can't tell what it is, and then they go, ah, it's American. 
It's got a little bit of everything. Yeah, they're like, oh, the scrolls yeah. this, the scrolls this, the bodies the this, yeah, the f holes are this, the wood. Yeah, what what the heck were they? Ah, uh, uh, it's American. We we took a look at our bases, and I'm going back to probably like 2010, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably about the time the Breshin hit. The Breshin was the first base we did this to. Well, it was, we, it, it was an organic progression yeah. from what we'd already done. But we took a look at our base and we said. You know, we're, we're American. I mean, that's not a bad thing. I don't mean that as a, a right. negative, but right. it was just like, man, it was a hodgepodge of different styles. It was like Prescott F holes and a French neck block and, and rib taper and, and, and uh, early Italian scroll. So it was all these kind of yeah. different schools of design pushed into one. And it was like, yeah, we were uniquely American. We were all over the map. Yeah. So we got geeky and we said, well, let's, well, like Tony let's refine it. Like Tony Falanga's car model. Yeah. Prescott F holes, yep. Gamba. That French uppercut with yeah, that cello shape, one. yeah. yeah. That, and, and even his neck block is the that's the, ni style. the ninety degree neck block where the neck literally sits ninety degrees in the body, which you'll see on most other makers. In, in yeah, and then we taper it in the top. Dave Bergeron kind of encourages to remember yep. the guy Tapered from what is it, Earth? Who's he, who's he play with? Earth, Wind, and Fire. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah, yeah he kind of the tuba Combo. player. He wanted us to bring the the shoulders in, and then as we did that, we said, well, what the heck? Let's kick the neck back. So now you have a, a neck Change pitch. Change our geometries. Get, right. get, get to the same location, but through different geometries. Yes. Yeah. And now we have a neck pitch, version two, version three, essentially, of the neck block that allows for the adjustable neck and allows the back to be smaller. So now we can give people bigger bases that are actually smaller. Still more playable, yeah. You know, it wasn't like, well, what do we call this base? Well, you know, because some companies have come up with these fake names, you know? It wasn't like the Gary Upton base or the Eric Roy base. You know, I got six guys downstairs busting butt for me all day yeah. long making bases. Not, not get, cool, right? They yeah. can't put all of their names in it. Yeah. So we gave the tip of the hat to the different, to the different schools of design. Yeah. So Breschen. If you characterize what a Breschen-style instrument is, that's, that's what our Breschen is. Our Mittenwald, our Bohemian, they're all the same way. And today, our Bostonian, our American base... You know, it's got Italian f holes, it's got Caprilla f holes, it's a big old yeah, that's kind of, kind of our, shape. That's our soup, so, de, soup de jour, right? So, so our Bostonia is, is still our kind of tip in the hat back to where we started with yep. our uh, uniquely American, you know, all over the place. Gentle changes. <laughs> Gentle changes, but changes keep on a coming. Well, right, and, and, because we yeah. listen. Yep. Yeah. We listen. We're not so egotistical. They're like, no, you're wrong. It's this way. Well, it's nice. It's nice to see, you know, we don't, I won't cite a lot of names, right? But it's nice to see, like, the Pullman brothers, definitely. The Pullman family definitely did it correctly and, and identify. I feel like they had, at, you know, maybe 15 years ago, I feel like there were too many models. But at least they said, hey, that's, this is this model. This is, while theirs are all, stay very German within that design, I appreciate that, you know? If you, think of guys like the Martins in England. I mean, you know what you're getting from Tom and George Martin. You're getting a big base. You're not going to them because you're thinking you're going to get a base. Um, who's, who's, the, who's the maker that makes uh, Francois' base? Oh, the, the Labarie? Yeah. You're not, going to, you're yeah. not going to Martin because you're thinking you're going to yeah. get a Labarie yeah. style yeah. base, yeah. you know, or a quinoil pattern little thing, right? Yeah. But I, I think makers sometimes preclude themselves from, I can say that if I put Tom Martin and Gary Carr next to each other on the bass playing their basses of choice I love to listen to both of them right but one would say the other they, they're well they're both gentlemen so they wouldn't say this but I'm going in their mind as like I'm gonna say <laughs> say it the bad way right one would say the other's bass is far too big and why is he hurting himself playing that bass the other would say come on that thing's tiny why don't you get yourself something that booms you know but you know, I think we've tried to approach our making. We want to make both those guys happy. Yeah. yeah. Right? And you did make one of those guys very, very happy. happy. Yep. In yeah. Nice segue. Yeah. And to talk about the evolution of this car, car? base and the story behind that. I, th yeah. uh, we, I think we just reached out. I can't remember who. Was it you? We reached out to him, just sent him an, an email, just a shot in the dark, and just said, Hey, I, man, I encourage one of our staffers sitting at the front desk at Togwonk to send him a night, send Gary a nice email. And say, yep. This episode is brought to you by Diderio Strings. Our friends at Diderio want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. When you pull the string through the peg, twist it around itself a few times before continuing to wind. This pulls more of the string through the peg neatly, and it decreases the likelihood of the string falling out of tension. Learn more at orchestral.diderio.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. 
This episode is brought to you by the A440 Violin Shop. It's located just down the street from Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago on the north side, just off the Brown Line. I have been going there my entire adult life, and they have been fantastic, both for repairs. I've had cracks repaired. I've had seams glued. I've had all sorts of students go to A440 to get instruments, to get bows. They're available with a smile, do wonderful work, and definitely check them out if you are in the Midwest. A440violinshop.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Well, right, and, because we yeah. listen. Yeah. yeah. We listen. We're not so egotistical. They're like, no, you're wrong. It's this way. Well, it's nice. It's nice to see, you know, we don't, I won't cite a lot of names, right? But it's nice to see, like, the Pullman brothers, definitely. The Pullman family definitely did it correctly. And, and identify, I feel like they had, you know, maybe 15 years ago, I feel like there were too many models. But at least they said, hey, that's, this is this model. This is, while theirs are all, stay very German within that design, I appreciate that, you know. If you think of guys like the Martins in England, I mean, you know what you're getting from Tom and George Martin. You're getting a big bass. You're not going to them because you're thinking you're going to get a bass. Um, who's, who's, the, who's the maker that makes uh, Francois bass? Oh, the the Labory. Yeah, you're not going to you're yeah. not going to Martin because you're thinking you're going yeah. to get a Labory yeah. style yeah. base, you yeah. know, or a quinoil pattern little thing, right? Yeah. But I, I think makers sometimes preclude themselves from. I can say that if I put Tom Martin and Gary Carr next to each other on the bass, playing their bases of choice, I love to listen to both of them, right? But. One would say the other, they, they're, well, they're both gentlemen, so they wouldn't say this, but I'm going in their mind as like, I'm going to say, <laughs> say it the bad way, right? One would say the other's bass is far too big, and why is he hurting himself playing that bass? The other would say, come on, that thing's tiny, why don't you get yourself something that booms, you know? But, you know, I think we've tried to approach our making, we want to make both those guys happy. Yeah. yeah. Right? And you did make one of those guys very, very happy. happy. Yep. Yeah. Nice segue. Yeah. To t- talk about the evolution of this car, car? base and the story behind that. I, th- yeah. uh, we, I think we just reached out. I can't remember who. Was it you? We reached out to him, just sent him an, an email, just a shot in the dark, and said, Hey, I, man, I encouraged one of our staffers been, sitting at the front desk at Togwonk to send, him a ni- send Gary a nice email and yeah, say, Hey. Gary was at kind of the forefront of ergonomics in, yeah. in commissioning different bass makers to make ergonomic models to his playing style. And he, and he basically, he replied. He said, yeah, but, you know, here's what I'm looking for. I want something, you know, that's this, 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 and this. He sent the sketches. Oh, and, and by and the all. way, I want it affordable that any anyone going to my car camp could afford it. Yeah. So that was like the parameters. Yeah. And we started working with him, made a couple models, sent them off to him. He gave us feedback. Uh, you know, I think we probably did four or five different bases for him that we just gave him yeah. for feedback. Yeah, um, well, and we should put another one in production, Eric, at some point, just yeah. so Gary ha- can see the latest. And I know for a fact, you know, he and then in turn he he gave those bases to to, to deserving musicians. I know. I think like the second car yep. lives up in in Boston with this girl who's who's fantastic and and loves it and and she's where she is in her playing today because Gary Carr gave her one of our bases. You know, and and like it's crazy. Like with Gary, he's a, he's just a, such a kind person. Like we've tried to give him bases, and he. <clears throat> Like, just because of what he does for bass playing, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, he's a famous bass player. That's like, I have a good friend who says that's like being a famous snowmobiler. <laughs> go, ahead and, go ahead and name one, right? <laughs> you, you say to the average guy on the street, double bass, they're like a... A what? what like with, what? Yeah. They're, like, they're like, with what? Like lampshades on it or yeah. something? You're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, you know, we've, we've, Gary's always just been, nope, no, I'm you know, calling up to, I'd like to pay for the... I'm like, geez, Gary, like, it's like you, man. Like, you're the yeah. real deal. Like, we're honored to work with you. But that's the evolution of the car model was just listening to Gary, listening to his feedback, not getting egotistical and telling him no, just making every design change that he, he suggested to, to where we are today. You know, now we can make a model for him and hand it to him, and literally he can walk on stage and and, and he can play it like at the what, like what, the fiftieth anniversary, ISB. yeah, right? the, yeah, twenty seventeen mm-hmm. ISB convention. Yeah, that was opening awesome. that it was up. Awesome. Keynote speaker Gary Carr came out with his uh, flashing, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, lights bow tie and, or whatever, in yeah. wonderful Gary Carr fashion. And then what does he do? He plays two wonderful selections on his car model mm-hmm. up to the yeah. base. Yeah. That was great. That was, was, that was, was a huge honor. Huge yeah. honor. Well, to, and, and that goes into like, I don't want to say we don't care because we do care about what I'm about to say. But if you're going to stand on your base and slap it with a set of guts, if you're a bass player, that you're, you know, you're part of the family, right? Like, and I think, again, that's what, 
just like makers have precluded certain people from their business model because of the styles of their instruments, they also preclude people from their being their clients, aka customers, aka friends for us, right? That oh well you play you play rockabilly, you do bluegrass, like you know, that's that's our crew. Those are all our crew, in, including the Gary Cars and the symphonic players. And, well, you know, I think that's even could be reflected in the in the artists that I've uh, sent you away for Eric podcasts. Revis, Eric we Revis. Got, we got uh, Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith. Yeah, exactly. uh, Willie Nelson's bass player, uh, Devil Todd Makes Parks. Three. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lucia it's all Tarina. over the map. Yeah, I mean, it's know? it's a really wide. Yeah, for, and Gary Carr, and mm-hmm. um, and then you've got people like Mark Ramirez, mm-hmm. and then also. Uh, uh, Tony Manzo, right? Oh, yeah, Tony Manzo. Yep. Tony Manzo, there you go. okay. And for Mark, you made a replica of a bass that he yeah. plays. Uh, and then did you do the same or similar? What did you do for Tony? I'm Tony forgetting. had a, an Italian bass from the 1700s that uh, we converted to a removal neck. So, okay. So, so his bass was just, a, we fixed it up and made it good. Uh, <laughs> or rather, not falling apart. Sorry, Tony. <laughs> Sorry, Tony. Um <laughs> Yeah, he walked into the first time. He goes, I want to make this a removable neck. I'm like, well, why don't we make it so the back's not falling off first? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But then, um, then it but can yeah, travel. We did, a, we did a conversion of his bass. In fact, there's like a four, there's a four part video series on our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the key pieces of our, our removable neck si- you know, system that, uh, in, in, insert uh, Gary advertising, no, but, but really just a tech, you know, a little tech talk on that piece. Yeah. Like, that is one of the keys of what can be done. I'm glancing over at a 1845 Prescott massive thing, and I I know that again a crude version. I can have Eric cut the neck out, wince right, mm-hmm. um, put in the removable neck system before the end of the day's out, like today. I mean, trust me, I'd want some refinement. I bet he could have it done in about two hours. Okay. I mean, that's not what we do. That's not what right. we did for Tony at all. Right. But that's really the key. Retrofitability is how we designed our system. Mm-hmm. Hey, that, that, now again, that's one of our superpowers going back to even you know, making the first base, being able to, to move fast, to, to be able to take an idea from the, from the literally from the whiteboard. Like yeah. we were talking earlier on, I'm going to go off another tangent, that suitcase base yes. that we've been experimenting yep. with. That literally Gary walked in, said, here's this idea I had, drew this quick thing on the whiteboard and said, bake this for me. Well, I mean, it goes back a few few more years, right? Like where I've been like kind of ruminating on how I want that to happen. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, I think I can do this this way. Then I come in and say to Eric, hey, that standard laminate you're making for Joe Schmo over there, steal that. Steal that. I want that. I want you to cut it up like this. I Sorry, want you to Joe. do this to the blocks, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then turn that into, but it's it's really 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 one of the powers. Like Eric's saying, if you're China, and again, if you want your off the line base that is inexpensive and you need that instant gratification, for whatever reason, get it, do it, right? But if you want to be able to, what our manufacturing, we can turn on a dime, right? You can play. We, we when we take everyone's opinion, whether it's John Petitucci shows up with his wife and his kids, or Jason Heath or Joe over here, we're always listening. Mm-hmm. Communication, like mm-hmm. you, like mm-hmm. keep talking about that, and we can take something before the end of the days out and go downstairs and put it into our process. If you're in China or I don't care Poland, Romania, wherever it be, and you're buying bases as an American distributor or retailer, and you're buying them a hundred at a time. Two things. Can you speak the language? Even if you can speak the language, how many are underway? How many are on the water coming over? How many are already many are in the, the warehouse? Pipeline before the first prototype right. happened. So if you have this immediate change that, oh my God, Jason blew my socks off by commenting on the accessibility of the bow on the G-string on the Brescian when he was you know, playing XYZ, we really need to move that corner a little bit. You know, How long does it take you when you have hundreds of instruments made if you can even make it happen right right it, it'll be a couple bases here that's the point right that's, right. that's fun right. and if we don't like what it results in just a couple later we'll tweak it some more yeah you can move, move quickly and pivot quickly, pivot quickly and move fast yeah listen say yes <laughs> well so you put out this uh suitcase Base video, which got a lot of attention, and I love one of my pleasures in life is watching the comment stream on Upton videos or, or pieces of content, and that's the mark of engagement, right? So, can we talk a little bit about 
this this suitcase base it really fits in a suitcase that's actually a samsonite suitcase we're seeing in that yeah. video right which i will link up to this video we'll, ha okay. we'll have we'll have to show you i i want to see what this. time is yeah. it what well, we should yeah. uh yeah we yeah, should yeah. No. Okay. taking it apart is pretty quick i mean either way yeah i mean eric and i have sat on the outskirts of the travel base market i mean i remember sitting he was he was in togwonk eric was in togwonk i was in boston was working in Boston with with Josh at our 1108 Boylston Street location, watching all the college kids in and out of Berkeley, the conservatory, all that stuff. And I remember the phone rang and Josh was like, hey, Gary, it's David. And, and I picked up the phone and there's David Gage. I'm like, hey, Dave. He's like, Gary, you really think there's a market for this whole neck comes off the base case thing? And I'm like, if you want to make a thousand ever, sure. But like, I don't think I would imagine even to date, there's not, may, maybe it starts tipping out there, but yeah. I, you know, so we, we, we kind of debated it for a little bit, you know, and, but we're still bound. We've seen really smart stuff. Like who is the, who is the great French guy that's sitting next to us at that? Oh, Patrick. Patrick Char Chartone? Chartone, yeah. yeah. Yeah, his model. Yeah, yeah. The brilliant engineering right. ideas yeah. on these genius. models. Genius. I mean, yeah. I told him, I said, mad genius. Yeah. yeah. He is. Yeah. He is. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. But like, you're still bound by the dimensions of the body. Yes. Exactly. And then it's like, all right, do we cut it in half? You know, we've we've all seen people truncate instruments, bodies, and they just don't. I'd rather hold a body together with bolts and fasteners and still have a whole base body right. than to cut an upper bout off or potentially a lower bout off or put holes here and there and do, you know. Yeah, it's, when, it's, when it's all together on stage and someone's sitting in the first row, it just needs to look like a base. Yeah, and sound like one and feel like one when you play it, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it, you know, that was really like the, all right, we've got to make the body smaller, right? Yeah. How do, Josh Goodall. Yeah, exactly. How <laughs> do we make the body smaller? Well, it's only wood. We can make things fit together. I mean, you could glue together the suitcase base, right? And essentially oh, yeah. never, never take it apart it's, again. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a real base. There's no, there's no tricks. Yeah. The amazing thing about it, because the first one we just did, we did fast. It was kind of a working prototype. Yep. We were shocked when we were done that it it didn't lose anything, yeah. you know? It, it wasn't shaking and rattling. It didn't lose any oomph. Um, I just figured with all that leaking air that uh, it, it wouldn't be able to produce sound. It wouldn't, it wouldn't pump. But it sounds like a real bass. Well, it's funny then, you know, that's where you go into the little bit of, you know, then I talk to the smart people, right? And the scientists, that, you know, friends that I'll, I won't men mention who they are, but they'll, you know, they start, I start talking to the acoustical engineers and the acousticians and such and they're like well you gotta understand those frequencies don't see that mm, yeah you know so they, they you know so we all imagine that it's like water right, right. oh it's gonna be exactly. gushing out these holes and yeah. Things. yeah and if the holes are big enough the sound is in in the chamber doing certain things but the bass really doesn't care it cares about the weight but it doesn't really care if you bolt the back on the bass doesn't care as we've proven if the neck comes out as long as the joint's good right it doesn't you know we've had I mean, is Tony complaining? Back to Tony Monzo, right? It, it, no, it, these guys it play, actually better. <laughs> that's what they say. They're like, oh, wow, the joint, you know, and we actually give you a better fitting joint with a removable neck. It's so, got better coupling. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard that a lot of the people, they had that experience when they get a really good removable neck system in there. That, that, it, that, that uh, I don't know what the right word is for it, but that, it, yeah, it's a better foundation. Better coupling, yeah. yeah. It's a better I think, coupling. Okay. I think it's just that someone's really spent a lot of time yeah, because there's most bases. Up, well, I wouldn't say most, because that's just such a generalization. A lot of neck joints are they're shit. soggy. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Neck joints are just soggy. I yeah. mean, you can go soggy. I like you, that. You can yeah. Google it, and you can see really fast. I just saw on the double base luthiers thing. You'll see a prominent manufacturer of bases. You know, neck out of body, space underneath the neck heel. Yeah. Look at an old K base. I mean, there's more glue touching wood than there is wood touching yeah. wood. You know, so I'd venture to say there's. I made no one of those brash. Sorry, you know, it's good. Brash right. statement years ago that if we ever had a neck joint in an Upton base fail, yep. I will sand it down and eat it at yep. the next <laughs> ISP competition. <laughs> and that hasn't happened yet. No. Okay. Not on my that watch. It will yeah. never happen. The wood breaks, right? Yeah. So yeah. The, the wood, there's yeah, no question. Breakaway heels? Yeah, right. Yeah, break. Yeah, exactly. We designed that instrument so the heel could break away. Like, <laughs> really? Really? That's, yeah. 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 So that's. That's that's I, I feel like the design of the whole instrument starts at the neck block, yeah. you know, like, and that's what deems where, you know, Eric and I look at it two different ways, but again, that's how we yeah. work the way we do. 
Yeah, no, do you, have you played? Did you play the suitcase space yet? Well, I would love to do it after we. Uh, yeah. After we. All right, cool. Wrap up. So, so a uh, uh, friend of the podcast actually he he publishes all these episodes and promotes them online. Trevor Jones. Trevor. You're in the midst of a commission and yeah. a lot of people have commission bases. Mm -hmm. So, and you've talked about the, the email chain. You're talking yeah. about the phone and hours and hours. But like 20, 30 emails yeah, to me and Trevor. Uh, right. So, <laughs> so, like talk me through the commissioning process. Someone, Someone's listening and they follow you and if they don't, they should because it's, it's, it's interesting and also entertaining, uh, especially reading the comments and something like the suitcase base. But talk me through the talk me through the commissioning process. One of, one of the interesting things is a lot of times, by the time someone's actually reaching out to us, they've consumed so much of our content already. It, they, a lot of times, they they kind of already know where they're going with it. When when by the time they actually get into that conversation with Gary or I, you know, a lot of it, say, I open up the email in the morning. You know, I got a, a, either a web request or just a, an email from the from the homepage. It's, you know, someone's usually stating their their budget, their what they think they need, what they're playing. A lot of times, it's almost like a history of them as a player. Kind of like what you said, like you know, hey, tell yeah. me about yourself. Yeah. That's the way a lot of the emails first start off. It's like they're just telling us about themselves, and then it's just a conversation from there, and, and just trying to make everything match up: budget, intentions, history, what they're doing with the instrument and just guiding that to hopefully the right base. Yeah, I think it's interesting when you, Eric says budget, because I know for a fact, a lot of times he and I completely d ignore that. Because like, j you know, you could tell me you need X, Y, and Z, and then say you want to spend this, and a lot of times we have to have that long sh but short conversation right. of, well, you're not going to get that for that, right? right? It, but it certainly is, it goes back to, like you said, communication, just, you know, just simply listening to what they want. A lot of times they'll start even in the order process because the turnaround time is somewhat lengthy and yeah. Eric will say, Hey, you know, we're, we're about ready to, we, you know, we, we may have already cut your neck. We might've cut the blocks and started roughing the top and so on and so forth. And then they're like, you know what? I've been hanging in there. I got my deposit and X, Y, and Z happened in my life. And now I want to do a little more like that. He, he does that all the time all with the time. people. Yeah. Yeah. I took an order a couple weeks ago. The guy's already like, yeah, I want to change that to the, to the Bohemian hybrid deluxe. And, it, and it's, you know, for this, this and this reason, it's like you're talking about with Trevor, like, you know, you enter the process of buying with us. A lot of people feel like they got to know what strings, what bag, da 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 all these things. And, and they, you know, I understand it's an important life, you know, life decision as a musician, like when you're getting your bass. But I always assure them, and Eric does too, like, you're just starting. You know, like, you don't gotta have to have all that teased out. Right. You know, like, right. you get, we put your name down. You're, we're not making your bass tomorrow. You gotta hang out and wait for a while. And we're gonna figure out whether it's the bag or n nothing's going to happen like right eric there's a lot of squishy room not concrete I and mean, we like to get a lot of it down on paper on, from the beginning so that you're not surprised at the end like oh i thought i was getting a two thousand dollar base and all of a sudden my invoice is three thousand you know like to get a lot of it up front but there's a lot of like decisions that on the initial order that are tbds to to be determined and, I, and I, I think because we're neurotic <laughs> confessedly like we have had in over time very, very few of those interactions where a guy said, I want this, and we've just said yes, right? Like that, that, that old uh, customer's always right concept doesn't actually prove to be true. The guy said, I want this, we've made him the base, or we've sold him the base, and we knew we should have said, yeah, guy, this is not the right base for you. And we've delivered on something that we felt uncomfortable about. So we just don't do that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'd rather We've see learned how to say no. Yeah. We say yes a lot, but we've learned how to say no. Yeah. Or if we say no, we essentially, we can, we can still say yes in a way that will send you where you need to go. Right. I rather want a Bohemian five string removable neck with a low C. Yeah. Right. You know, like we'll get these weird, really weird requests. I mean, because no, wait, we're wait, wait. Say it again for the listeners. A Bohemian what? Bohemian. Five string. Five string. Yep. Um, With a C extension. Yeah, right. We've done We've that, done that too, too, right? Yeah, like C, go C to C, high sure. C, low C. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, or we had that gentleman that wanted a, um, he wanted a brushin with, again by design, it's cool, a brushin with a four string, and a five string neck. Yeah, one. So of you each. got two tail pieces, two bridges. So he could bounce between the two two setups. You know? All right. Yeah, well, yeah, we can we can do that. So. But it really needed to be. It really two needed to be uh, two different sound posts. Bring yeah. it to your luthier every time you change it. Right. Not like on the gig, right. like you're just gonna slept, slept, you know. And he said, "Well, it really works well as this kind of bass." I think it was the fiver, uh, the four string. He's like, "I love it when it's a four. I'm not so loving with them as a five. It's like, 
you know, retrospect, it's like, well, yeah, because not enough things in the, you know, change between the, the yeah. two. So it, we, we shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And I wouldn't do it again. Right. Or if we did do it, it's at least having the education now that from the experience yep. of doing it to say, yes, we can do that. But here's what you need to expect. Yeah, expect. Or here's what you need to do to get the true performance out of it. Communication, so yeah. Communication, yeah. yeah. Well, it's it's exciting to follow along with everything that you that you all do here, and whether it's the suitcase base or whether it's the the uh, custom orders that people can do, whether it's the five string, low C to high C, or anything in between. It's really it's really cool to uh, to be here and chat with you guys. And I just I I thank you. you Thanks know, for coming. Yeah. yeah, it's great to have you here. And yeah. Uh, I think we got one of the best jobs on earth. Yeah, let's let's do another one in the future. If I, I like to say that these kinds of things hopefully generate some uh, questions and ideas, right? Yeah, and so yeah, let's call out to questions. Anything you want to ask uh, Gary or Eric, I happily uh, you can get get in touch with. Just go to uptonbase.com, or if you want to uh, reply to this, you know, on social media yeah, or on Facebook, me, I'll, comment I'll, I'll, down I'll, below. We'll, yeah, we'll, we take yeah, a look. We'll answer it. questions down yeah, below. Cool. Cool. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. No, thanks for coming, Jason. It happened. So glad to have chatted with you guys. And thanks so much for taking the time. And what a cool journey. Can't wait for the next 10, 20 years of Upton Bass. And thank you for listening to the podcast. I have such a great time chatting with people like Gary and Eric and doing trips like what I did to go to New York. The only reason I went to New York was to talk with people for the podcast. This is the first of many conversations coming from New York, and I get such special, unique joy from actually sitting down in person. Yes, we can do this over Skype or other methods, but there's nothing like the in-person connection that is just so powerful. And thank you for listening because we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you. And thank you again to Upton and the other people that sponsor this show. It's not cheap <laughs> to go to New York or go to various places like that and take a week and you know all the things involved in that. So couldn't do it without them. So thank you for doing this. And I really hope you enjoyed this episode. We have a lot of Luthier related episodes that we've done. And if you go to controversyconversations.com slash Luthiers, L-U-T-H-I-E-R-S, you'll hear my conversation with over two dozen, I think, Luthiers from the Oberlin Violent Society of America, the VSA workshop this past summer, as well as people like Barry Colstein, who, by the way, you'll be hearing from in a long anticipated round two interview during the same trip uh, to New York. I also went up and went to Baldwin, New York, first time ever in the Colstein shop. So that was very cool. I toured the D'Addario String Factory. And like I said, I chatted with so many people like Rex Serrani, principal bass of the Met Orchestra, Kenny Davis, who used to play in the Tonight Show band, Michael Thurber of The Late Show with Stephen Colbert and many, 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 many others. So very fun trip. Many of those interviews were done at the D'Addario Manhattan showroom, in, which is very cool, in Midtown. And yeah, good times. Many more of those trips in store for sure. Contraries Conversations is produced by Steve Hinchy, Michael Cooper, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. If you're looking for a double bass or any sort of double bass related work, Mitch is in the Texas, uh, the Dallas, Fort Worth area, kind of east of there. Look him up online at his beautiful new website, MitchMooring.com. And thank you also to Krista Copper, who is marvelously compiling and cataloging all the topics we talk about so we can bring you thematic best of episodes and fuel future projects. I am Jason Heath, your host, and having such a good time doing this, by the way. And we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.